This is a video for chapter 11. And as we get started, uh, let me start by saying we're going to skip chapter 11.1. .1. So even though some of the slides I'm going to show you from Dr. Uh, Shanshan Love uh, have 11.1 .1 at the top, we're going to actually skip that part. Um, chapter 12 actually has some of the same material, so we're going to be getting uh, to that a little bit later. Anyway, um, this chapter talks about comparing two groups. And comparing two groups is actually a thing we really want to do. Um, if you think about um, so many experiments or so many things we want to study, the idea of looking at uh, before and after, comparing freshmen and seniors, uh, the control group and the experiment group or the vaccine, um, men and women, whatever thing you could think about, having two groups that you want to see if there's a difference between them is going to be um, just a thing that people are really interested in. And um, there are two different ways really to think about having the two samples. Um, the first one is independent samples, which is where you're looking at two um, different groups. So something like freshmen and sophomores, or the control group and the experimental group, or men and women, or whatever. And <clears throat> um, the main thing is, is that these are two discrete uh, groups of people or two discrete uh, whatever it is you're studying. You could be comparing two species of butterfly. It doesn't have to be two groups of people um, or two products or two whatever. But that's compared to dependent samples, which is where you're really comparing one group measured twice. So that would be things like before and after. Or on a survey, we're going to compare question seven to question eight and see how it goes. Um, we're going to do a pretest and a post-test in an education study. Um, we're going to look at the water levels before uh, the dam was built and after the dam was built or before climate change and after climate change, but something where the groups really are measuring the same thing both times. So independent samples, you're going to really have two discrete groups. Dependent sample, you're going to have one group, but you're going to look at them twice under some different circumstance as you do that. <clears throat> um, and um, I mentioned uh, control and experimental groups. There are times where um, you would use the same group twice. So for instance, in a stress test um, for heart rate and stuff, you would measure the same person, uh, measure their heart rate, then after they rode on the uh, um, stationary bicycle for a few minutes, you measure their heart rate again. So those would be um, examples of dependent samples as opposed to independent samples. Dependent samples, um, is what we're going to talk about first. That's 11.2. Independent samples is 11.3, and that's going to be um, the next video. So again, 11.1 we're going to skip. 11.2 this video is going to talk about, and 11.3 um, will be the one after that. <clears throat> okay, so we can talk about different examples of what we might be interested in, but here's an example of we want to compare um, 13 fathers with their adult uh, sons. And we just want to see if one group is bigger than the other. Certainly, we know there's uh, the idea that um, in more recent times, nutrition has been better. And certainly, in some cultures, uh, current generations are taller than past generations. Um, what that means, though, is that we can really think about um, how each measurement is really the same group twice, right? This is a family unit. Feather five. Blah, blah, blah. Family one has a father and a son. Family five has a father and a son. So you couldn't just mix these up. This 72.8 goes with the 68.9. And <clears throat> the idea is we can look at the average of the differences instead of just um, treating these as two, again, totally different groups. So um, the name we have for that difference is D. D is for difference. And remember, difference is subtraction. And the average difference, D bar, is just the sum of the differences. OK? So that difference is going to give us a population mean. It's going to give us a sample mean. And we're going to write a confidence interval that looks just like the confidence interval we had back in chapter 9. But instead of looking at X bar, we're going to be looking at D bar. We're going to look at the standard deviation of the D, and everything's the same. Because we're still estimating the standard deviation from uh, the data, we're going to use T instead of Z. And um, it's going to actually be relatively straightforward. 
So that is, instead of thinking of this as 13 pairs of data, 26 points, we're going to subtract them. So 70.1 minus 68.3 is 0.8. And then we're going to have 13 points, which are the 13 differences. <clears throat> okay. So we're still going to set up the problem the same way. We're going to have a null and an alternate hypothesis. In our story, um, she was looking at the sons are taller than their father. So that's a one-sided test. So that's going to be right or greater than. We're going to pick an alpha and then we're going to calculate the value. Okay, then we're either going to reject or not reject uh, using a p-value. We're going to always use this method too in this class. And then we're going to state our conclusion. Either there was a statistically significant difference between fathers and sons, or there's not going to be a statistically significant difference between fathers and sons. Okay, well now we just math. And here we are, we're just subtracting them. And you can see uh, she did all the calculations for you. That's what I did on the front screen. But we just subtract them all from the others. So again, instead of 26 points, we're going to think of 13 pairs of points. And then we're just going to calculate it. So we take the average of all of these D numbers, these differences. Jump, jump, there's 13 of them. Jump, and I can't draw, but that's okay. And we're going to calculate the difference means and the standard deviation of those differences. Notice that the difference is going to be relatively close to zero because, right, you're subtracting the one from the other. So instead of thinking about how tall people are in inches, we're going to think about the differences between them. And so that's why the difference is less than an inch and the standard deviation is 2.8, right? That standard deviation is actually pretty close to what we had before when we were looking at heights. Okay. Then we're going to go ahead and calculate. Well, first we're going to describe the parameter. So the mean is the difference between the heights. The null hypothesis is that there's no difference, null. And the alternate hypothesis, the one we're interested in, is that the mean is less than zero. Less than zero just because of the way she subtracted it. We could have subtracted son from father, right? You can subtract either direction. But because we believe the sons are taller than the fathers, it's going to be a less than sign. Then we're going to calculate the value. Certainly the raw value is less than zero. So a negative 0.39 is our value. We can look that up on a t-table or do the other calculations. We're going to typically have StatCrunch do it for us or whatever, um, or the spreadsheet do it for us or your calculator. But since we can look it up on the calculator with 12 degrees of freedom, remember there's 13 pairs. So we're not looking at 26 data points. We're looking at 13 pairs. That means our degrees of freedom is 12 for the 12 pairs of data. And that gives us a critical value of 2.681. Remember, 2 is our general value because the sample size is small. And because we're looking at 0.01 instead of 0.05%, we're using 2.681. Since that is not bigger, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We can uh, look that up exactly, but it's uh, 0.351. So that means 35% of the time, we would expect to get data like this if the null hypothesis is true. And that's not rare at all. Then we reject the null hypothesis, and now we restate it back in the question using the words that the question is interested in. There is no significant um, evidence to support that sons are taller than their fathers in this data set. And in fact, <clears throat> thinking of the current generation, that is you and your parents, um, that tends to be true. For me and my parents, a little bit older than you, um, my generation actually is taller than the generation before us who grew up in the depression and all those sorts of things. Um, so yeah. Um, we can look for another example. Again, we can do a hypothesis test or a confidence interval. I'll show you how to do both of those in StatCrunch here in a minute. But here is another uh, um, experiment. So this one is looking at uh, whether a caffeine pill was going to change uh, the way the exercise went. So was the difference between the placebo group and the caffeine pill group um, going to be enough to show that there's a difference in the amount of um, energy expended during um, exercise? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and calculate that. And again, that's just math now. So we got the mean of D bar. We got the value from the table. We got S, which is the value that was calculated. There were 10 pairs. And again, here it's more obvious that there's 10 people because it's before 
um, and after. And then we get the confidence interval, which goes from four to 31 and a half. Based off of that, zero is not in the confidence interval. So just like we did back in chapter 10, that tells us that there probably is a real difference between uh, the exercise without a caffeine pill and the exercise with a caffeine pill. This study actually made news a few years ago when it came out because it said the caffeine really does help you exercise better, um, which you're all college students. You probably didn't need me to tell you that. All right, so let me show you how to do this in uh, the computer. So here is a spreadsheet and um, here is a survey that um, I was part of a few years ago of faculty at Truman. And so the question we asked was, um, do we think the writing instruction that we do actually helps our students become better writers? And there were two questions that we were especially interested in. Does the Writing is Critical Thinking course, WACT, as we call it sometimes, right, English 190, does that improve writing? And then GINS, the GINS course that you take in your junior year, does that improve writing? Of course, at Truman, we have you take multiple writing experiences in your major, those two campus-wide requirements, um, with the idea that becoming a better writer is important. So um, what we can do then is look at the difference between the two groups. Um, again, I just wrote the scores out here. There were 80 some uh, people in the study. And you can see all the data here. Notice that I have it written in two columns because we asked everybody two questions, right? Did you think WACT improved students' writings and did you think GINs improved students' writing? So for person number two, they gave a five, so they think WACT did help improve it. It was a one to seven scale. Did they think GINs improved it more? So their difference is minus one. So a negative number means they think GINs was more helpful. A plus number means they think WACT was more helpful. Okay, as we look across, what we see is there's some that are positive, some are negative, a fair number are zero. So that means they think eh, it improves at some, and especially a four, right? A four is the midpoint on the scale. So that's exactly neutral. They are mostly positive numbers, but we don't really care what the actual number is in this case. We're only looking to see what the difference is. And in this case, the difference is 0 0.048 with a standard deviation of 1.6. We had 83, 83 people in the study, so that's 82 degrees of freedom when we get that far. Okay, I copy that into StatCrunch, and here are the numbers. And again, I put the difference here, but you don't need to do that. Um, I'm just going to do that so I can show you how it works. And oops, I got to get back to my mouse. There we go. And if I go to T, this is a T because our standard deviation is estimated. Paired is one of the choices right there. So this is a paired T test looking at the two variables. Column one is WACT improved. Column two is GINs improved. We, it will even save the differences for you. So it'll calculate and make that column. I already did that. We're going to calculate the confidence interval at 95%. We'll get some summary statistics because it's handy to do. And here we go. So as we look at that, right, the two means the two standard deviations are pretty close. Notice that gives the same data that I calculated over here in the spreadsheet. Stack crunch will do that for you. N equals 83. The sample sizes are always going to be the same, right, because you're measuring the same person twice. If that N doesn't match, something's wrong. Um, and in fact, the software, if one is missing, like the person skipped a question on the survey, it'll remove them from the calculation altogether. So you'd have 82 or whatever, because you take the person out. Then we look at the confidence interval that we got. And what we see is the confidence interval goes from minus 0.39 to plus 0.3, right? The mean of that difference is 0 0.048. Right on a seven point scale, 0 0.048 is a very small difference. And again, that's what we found over here, 0 0.048. With the standard error, I didn't even do the standard error over here, although I can do that. Right, that's going to be uh, the standard deviation divided by square root of our n, and that gives us 0.173, which is good. That's what we have over there. So that's works really nicely for us. So that confidence interval, minus 0.4 to plus 0.3, is not at all significant, right? There's really no difference going on here. So again, this doesn't measure not whether or not people think uh, the faculty thought that GINs helped writing or WACT helped writing. It means it showed that there was no difference between them. 
<clears throat> so however much they helped, they helped about the same. Now, just for comparison's sake, because it's fun, if we do the one sample t-test on the same data, one sample with data, and we look at the difference, that's going to give us the exact same answer. If you want, you can pause the tape and go back and look. But mean 0.048, standard deviation 0.17, 82 degrees of freedom, and the difference minus 0.4-ish to plus 0.3-ish. Right, so those two answers are exactly the same. Right, so that's another way to say that when we're looking at these, whether or not we look at the difference calculated manually, I just subtracted them for you, or we look at the two columns as a paired t-test gives you the exact same answer. So there's no reason to really think about it either way. Let me go back here and do it again. And again, I didn't run this as a hypothesis test, but let's do that now. In stat t-tests paired, whacked, improve, and gins improved. And again, I don't need that subtraction column. And now we're going to do a hypothesis test. Now, you may have noticed that the mean in here is zero. And that's going to really make sense because typically we're just going to think about is there a difference between them? So if the difference is zero, there's no difference. So if we can reject an all hypothesis, that shows there is a difference. If we fail to reject an all hypothesis, that tells us that the difference isn't big enough uh, for us to see. All right, so we go ahead and run that. Here it writes your hypothesis out. Um, the idea that the difference equals zero or the difference does not equal zero. <clears throat> and then again, the mean, the standard error, the degrees of freedom are the same. Our, P st our T statistic is 0.27. That's not big, that's little. Remember two is normally what we think of. The p-value is 0.78. So that tells us 78% of the time we'd get data like this if the two things were equal. That's pretty likely. So we're going to conclude that we did not find any significant difference, right? We did not reject the null hypothesis. We cannot make any claim that the faculty thought whacked or gins was more or less effective as they're looking for things. Now I click that as a two sample test. You can do it as a one sample test. If you do this p-value will be cut in half. You can do that just for fun. Paired, whacked to gins, one sample test. And when we compute it, notice it is half the size. Instead of 0.78, it's 0.39. Okay, so that is how the uh, paired t-test uh, works. It does have different names. Sometimes people call it a related samples t-test or a dependent samples t-test or matched pairs. Um, in agriculture, they call it a split plot design, which is sort of a funny name because it makes you think of plots like we make in stats class. But it actually means if you take a plot of ground, right, plots, the other definition, if you put fertilizer on one and not the other, the soil will be the same otherwise, <clears throat> right? So. Um, you can see whether or not the fertilizer or the seeds or whatever the treatment is, more water, whatever would have a difference. So split plot, related samples, matched pairs, dependent samples, um, all of those have the same meaning. In practical terms, before and after, um, same question, or, uh, yeah, questions on the same survey, um, husband, wife, um, anything where you can think of pairs of data is where this uh, matched pairs test is going to work the best. So, all right, that's 11.2. The other video will have 11.3.